everyone, welcome to our very first live on YouTube. Let me introduce myself. My name is Maria, but some of you, some of you know me better as Maria the Korean Bride. Um, I founded the Private Museum Tours Company. Because of the pandemic, we're not able to give these private museum tour experiences in person. So we are doing them virtually with you until we're back to normal. Then let me introduce you to some of the people in the Zoom meeting with me right now. Michelle, she is one of our expert guides and also speaks fluent Mandarin. She's going to be one of the presenters along with myself today. She's a visual arts gallery director, consultant, advisor. She is a person to go to for anything art fairs related. So think of Art Basel in Miami, Hong Kong, Freeze Master in London, and New York. She mainly works between New York and Asia. We have Rhoda with us. Rhoda, if you could just say hello to everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay. Great to be with you. So she is an art collector and art lovers like all of you, I hope. <laughs> and she's going to be asking you, um, asking us rather questions, um, kind of representing you because we're not able to hear you and see you at this time. And lastly, my beloved Yasmin. She's my high school intern and she's going to be gathering your questions for us to answer at the end. So please drop us any comments, questions on the chat box and we will answer them again at the end. Now, some technical stuff I think we should go over since I don't know how every, where everyone is joining us from Internet connection wise, it may be iffy, maybe ours too. So um, please be patient with us or be patient with your computer, laptop, <laughs> smartphone. Let's just try to have fun with this and go with the flow. Okay, we're going to talk about these four artists that you see um, here in front of your screen. Now, I am going to go first, talking about my first chosen artist, Kara Walker. Michelle's going to share her first chosen artist, and then she's going to bounce back to me for the second artist that we have chosen. And so we will conclude this presentation after Michelle's um, presentation, after her second artist, and then followed by your questions and comments. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Can everyone hear us? Yes. Okay, I'm also asking the YouTube viewers. <laughs> so if you could just write yes, and then Yasmin will report back to us if that's not the case. All right. Kara Walker, as you could see, born 1969. Why did I choose her? She's a conceptual artist. She's mostly, and she's also a New Yorker now, originally from California. Okay, now, why did I choose her? She is known to talk about her content are based on race, gender, identity. So she talks mostly about her background as African-American using images from the antebellum South. Africans came as a slave and working out in the field and using images like this and famous for her cutouts and silhouette. I really didn't want to focus on these body of work. Why? She has created incredible, incredible outdoor public art installation with the Creative Times. Now you're wondering what is Creative Times? It's an art organization. Um, it's very competitive too. It was founded in the seventies. If they know of you, those artists out there, they make all the artist dream come true, um, making any gigantic monumental public art possible. You wanna make art with ice, 
they make that dream come true for you. You want to make art with fire? They make that possible for you. And Creative Times approached Kara Walker to do public art for this location in New York. Where in New York? Brooklyn. Domino Sugar Refinery Factory. Apparently it opened in 1882 and it's going to be demolished or maybe it did already in year 2014. Initially, Kara said no about this collaboration with the Creative Times. And then she went to visit the location and she just fell in love with it. Before I show you that final public piece, maybe some of you have seen it if you live in New York like us, I want you to look at this and tell me what stands out to you. 35 tons of sugar. That's roughly 70,000 pounds. 210 volunteers, 32 crew members. It took what, nine weekends? Or they showed it for nine weekends and then 130,554 visitors and it was free to the public. I mean, Rhoda, when you look at this, what comes to your mind? Maria, I'm not seeing it, unfortunately. But you've heard me reading I've that. I've seen loud. it before. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just the, the the gigantic size is so impressive, and to think that that it's composed of how many tons of sugar? I mean, it's overwhelming. I, I, I it's just amazing to me to see that. It's 30, uh, it looks it looks like concrete. It looks like concrete, really. Yeah, thirty five. Um, tons of um, sugar. So um, yeah, I think it's incredible concept. I mean, to comprehend visually, I don't even know, but you all know 70,000 pounds, what it's like to be 70,000 pounds. It, uh, Maria, and, is there any preservative on it? Because when I think of sugar, I mean, it sounds like it's such a fragile medium. I mean, do they spray it with anything that keeps it preserved? Do you know? That's I'm just a, curious. That's a good question. I don't know. Michelle, that's do you okay. know? <laughs> um, I actually don't know, but I've heard from people visiting the site later on during the course that they've seen other insects or things came out. So I'm assuming that is a question or to be addressed. Okay. Okay. So, um, great. So here's the piece. Now. Now I see it, very good. Okay, very good, here's the piece. Now, before I even talk more in detail with this particular public art installation, I want you to think of the location once again, Domino mm. Sugar Refinery Factory, right? Now, they're going to demolish part of this facility and landmark building part of it, not entirety. This is the new proposed project by the developer. I guess this is still going on. I didn't really pay attention. Michelle, do you know? Uh, not really. And I also think with the pandemic, all the plan has to alter. That's what I heard, even with Hudson Ya, the shade, everybody's re looking at post pandemic, what will be the uh, progress. So okay. I impact this. So um, yeah, I mean, so you could see they say they, they're going to preserve part of the Domino Sugar factory, but from this to this. So I just wanted to compare. compare. Um, sugar, I want you to think about sugar. I know I love sweets, like most of you. I know my niece, see, I would say, Amory, I ate too much sugar. <laughs> 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 so sugar. Think of sugar, how are sugars made from the sugar cane and sugar cane, who's making them, who's helping them to cultivate and get to that process where we are used to that crystallized sweet taste of sugar. Mostly by the slaves, right? Coming from Africa and working on them, traveling to the Caribbean because Caribbean, Caribbean is where they're making sugar cane produced products. So thinking of all of this history together, Kara Walker, no doubt, it triggered to create something like this. 
But before this, she was thinking about ruins. When you see ruins like this, what comes to your mind? Rhoda? <laughs> Is that? I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I don't know how that came to be, the ruins. <laughs> it's very depressing. <laughs> it I is, think. right? I mean, exactly. But ruins are, you know, man-made, you know, um, structure that's been destroyed and decayed or demolished. What, what once a long time ago represented power and authority gone or to commemorate something or to honor someone that's destroyed. So it, it has many different meanings if you think about it a little bit. And of course, Kara thought about the ruins and then she went to Egypt. Ah. So here is the pyramid and the majestic presence of that sphinx. And generally in the Greek mythological story, mythology stories, you know, the Sphinx women's, it's, they usually generally use women's face. In Egypt, they use men's face. But the idea is the same. What's the idea? There are symbolic representation of, you know, guardian protection. So if you think about that, when you see Kara's public art piece, It makes sense. And making that connection with sugar, right? But look at the color, the contrast between that white, leech white, right? And that little figurine surrounding it. We're gonna come back to these little boys, but I just wanna share side view so you could see the enormous scale oh, wow. of this piece. So roughly it's about 75 feet long, 35 feet high. So you could see it's really, really monumental. Wow. Yeah, I wonder if somebody, anyone, um, I don't know. Michelle, did you see this piece in person? I didn't, uh, but I do have colleagues who visited. They say, you know, once you've been in the side, not only the image, but the smell. Oh, and the smell. smell. That actually, some of my colleagues said the smell actually had an even more profound impact. Also, the contrast, the surroundings with the sculpture. So I do feel, I, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to go, but I think if you have an opportunity to see something like this, the impersonal experience, it's just very, very uh, strong. Yeah, and it's priceless. Yes, I, I agree with you. So, um, yeah, so I wonder um, if anybody try to lick it, <laughs> <laughs> touch it. <laughs> and you know, as a museum people that we are, I mean, the number one, what's the most important number one museum rule is not to touch, touch, not to touch. And I have this feeling, yes, a lot of people have indeed touched this piece. <laughs> <laughs> and then along with this giant centerpiece, she did little sketches of these little figurines. Now, I was thinking, oh, these are little boys carrying different, you know, baskets or carrying different objects. And then after looking into more, she was thinking about these figurines called the Blackamoor. I had to look it up. <laughs> I didn't know what Blackamoor was. It has two different meanings. One is representation of black African or dark skin people. Second one is used in decorative arts terminology. So um, non-European people represented in a very overly stylized way like this. So she's using this idea and creating these sketches, holding them like this. Mm. out of molasses. Do you see that? So it's interesting that she used the products of the South to create her work. It only makes sense, right? Because her content for her cutout silhouettes that I share with you originally, she's using these images, right? 
Africa is coming as a slave, working, plantation era. And then she also lived in, she went to school in Georgia, I believe. And so she's using that information and background and using molasses. So molasses is like byproduct of sugar before it gets to the final stage of getting bleached and becoming crystallized. So, and also this concept of molasses, it's syrupy, sugary, sweet, but the color is brown black. and brown. black, black or brown. So again, I think she's using that to tap into the color of the skin, right? For the black people. And look at this incredible molding. This was not an easy task for the crew members and herself. Why? Have you ever tried to make a nolly pop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I could only imagine how difficult that must have been to mold and shape to look like these little figurines. Right? And believe me, I'm told after having to listen to her lectures, they're melting away. <laughs> <laughs> they're melting. So can you imagine? Oh, but you could still see the shine, right? And you could imagine how that would have been in person. Although you ladies did not ask me, what is it really made out of besides the fact 35 tons of sugar? They had some kind of mold, some kind of form some kind of form, <clears throat> they had to use materials like this styrofoam oh. to create the carving for the centerpiece of the Sphinx. Make sense? And then the coating, the skin of the centerpiece had to be layered with 35 tons of sugar. Unbelievable. Right? So, um, yeah, I mean, that entire concept, oof, incredible. Now, she titled this piece, Subtlety, A Subtlety. And I had to look that up again, thinking, what does that mean? Something that's subtle? Well, I was surprised to see this. What is this? We're traveling to the Middle Ages, okay? There is a man, gentleman, holding what appears to look like a sheep or boat. Do you see that? Yeah. Right. So I, after looking at it and research, researching it some more, it's actually a subtlety. So during the medieval time, they would give these sweets, desserts in between the meals as to sort of entertain the guest. Part <laughs> of it could be edible, part of it could be not edible. Who knows? So, and they're generally made with sugar, something sweet. So she was thinking about using sugar, almost representing medicinal, you know, effect of sugar. So um, she titled it this way. It's a very long title, isn't it? Can you read that? Yeah. Sugar baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Subtlety or the mar marvelous sugar baby and homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet taste from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolitions of the domino sugar refining plant. What do you think about that long title? I only can also resonate with, uh, you know, uh, when I saw work by another artist uh, William Kendridge and talk about the long history, long journey a long migration journey that that somehow I resonate with this, the long journey coming to here. Yeah, I mean, there are many different things. I mean, the important key word, I think, is homage right here, right? So homage, um, yeah. overworked workers, artisans. So, um, yeah, so I have to say I'm very moved by this piece, especially now more than ever. And then at the end, this is not the um, end product. This is like the process in which they were making um, the centerpiece. But after the show was over, which roughly lasted about three months, May to June 2014, 
um, it got destroyed. So that concept of, you know, that impermanence, you know, that delicate, that short period that how this was honored, like what was honored in Kara Walker's mind on paid overworked artisans, right? And that all being vanished or destroyed at the end. Almost very much like going back to the concept of ruins we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, I would like to end with this short one minute video of how Kara started this process to the end, or at least a little bit of that, how that centerpiece was made. So um, let's check out the video together. And after that, Michelle is going to take over her first chosen artist. Everyone's okay so far? Yes, I hope Very so. Very good. Yeah. If not, Yasmin's going to also check in with the YouTube audience and report back to us if there is any problem. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and share a new, all right, clip. And that's the video here. Could everyone see this? I'm assuming, yes, you can. <laughs> All right, here we go. Make sure the audio is okay. I have no clue. Okay, so on that note, my first artist is done. I'm going to bounce back to Michelle. Thank you, Maria, and thank you all for joining. I'm very excited to launch our first live session, as Maria said. Um, art is my profession, but it's also my passion, mainly for its power to be able to go beyond nationality and personal history. But since the pandemic and the recent Black Lives Matter movement, like many of my colleagues, I start to rethink what is the role of art? And uh, what can we, uh, our professions in art world contribute? I feel that more than ever, art can act as a bridge between social dividers. So today I'm introduced by uh, two artists. I'm very fortunate to be able to know these two artists and work with them. I want to introduce some of their works. Um, they are quite different, you know, from different generation, from different continent. Their artwork at the first glance is also very different, but they do share this uh, common sense, common journey. It's much more from a personal perspective to look at exploring the uh, notion of race, what's the importance of race and what does race mean to them? And also this cultural identity. So the first artist I'm going to talk about is Madhu Peola Fadakba. It's a very difficult name for me to pronounce. She's based in Nigeria. <laughs> and uh, the second artist is Lisa Karen Davis. So let me share my screen. We can see what <coughs> some of the work. Tell me, uh, Maria, can you see? <coughs> 
Yes, I could see it. Rhoda, can you see it on yours? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, great. So Madhu Paola, I met her two years ago when she was doing a residency at ISCP, which is uh, International Studio and Curatorial Program based in <laughs> Brooklyn. Uh, she came here, she started making some works and I got introduced to her. Very charismatic <laughs> and uh, thoughtful artist. She, as I mentioned, was born in Nigeria, um, educated in US and the UK. Her education background was actually in chemical engineer and economics. So studying after graduation in the mid twenties, she started to explore paintings and drawings, also installation to really look at cultural identity or race issues with a focus on the social, geographical, political landscape in Nigeria and in US. This is her self-portrait. <coughs> so I want to focus on two of the series in her work. The most well-known series is called The uh, Synchronized Swimmer. She started uh, doing this series inspired by the research she was doing with uh, a publication by American professor Watson, um, Jeff Watson, really looking at the history of swimming pool and using swimming pool as a lens to look at race, politics, community life, gender issues. So I wanna show something that as we're very proud mm -hmm. as a result of her work. She started doing the swimming pool series in Nigeria. And in 2018 and 19, the Bazaar magazine using two of her work as the cover, which is very unusual. This is the first time this magazine is using uh, artwork by African artists. These are the two works. And recently we're so proud that she herself is featured in Vogue Brazil. So when she came to New York, she wanted to continue the project and she became very involved with the interesting swimming team, which is composed of all senior citizens in Harlem. And then they offer free swimming lessons to children and also they do they perform water aerobics. So mm -hmm. as a result of that, at the end of her residency, she presented her project, her work at the Brooklyn Museum. Also, she had an exhibition in New York. So I wanted to show a video, also a short one minute video about this particular project. Is that good, Maria? Yes. All right, let's see. I am going to show uh, this one here. Can you see it? Exhibition, I am looking at the swimming yeah. pool as oh, a wow. for communities to gather. This is all in color. Contested space throughout the uh, United States history, culturally and socially. The Harlem Honeys and Bears. Is the audio all the way up? Yes. Many of them talk about not having learned to swim until they were after 60, which also speaks to these ideas of lack of education and access to the swimming pool. It's an interesting thing when you sort of strip yourself down and you're half naked and people can trust you within that space. It really is an issue of, of trust, whether you trust not only the water, but the people within. Once I got into the water with them, I become part of them. So let me, sorry, let me go back to share a little bit of the image of the work from, from these uh, residency programs. Can you see the image now? Yes, I could. Wait, did you say what medium she used? I know she's a painter. Is it acrylic, oil? What is it? So she has uh, working on two different types. On the right, you can see the very bold red with gold leaf color. Those she used acrylic on canvas. 
and some of the others, for example, this one, she is using acrylic ink, but on paper that she also burns, we saw a little bit in our video. So um, as a self-taught artist, she has a really gift wow. eye for using colors. You know, sometimes image cannot describe certain things that she used color to really describe this emotional space. You can sense the temperature, atmosphere, and the physical sensations, movement and speed. So I, I, she loves to use gold leaf. That's her prime color but also very, very strong other color like red and blue. Also the practice of using burnt paper, it's quite interesting. Sometimes um, one wonders why she used that. I think she's also talking about, you know, with this particular project with swimming pool, in the end, once you're in the pool, actually there's a lot of emotion going on. There's, you're taking a risk, right? Working with someone there, you have to trust the person, but there's also a kind of coming together into it. So, so there's teamwork, there's resilience, there's trust, there's bravery, everything coming together, not in a so smooth way, there's struggle as well. That really represents, she feels, how the community is or how, you know, as African, artists, she often says, I'm thinking about what does it mean as an artist working out of Nigeria, a woman artist, a young artist, kind of maneuvering in this global art world. So she's using this very personal experience and touch to express her, you know, desire, her struggle. So wow. this, uh, yeah, this is a swimming series. Um, any, any, uh, Rhoda or Maria, you guys have any questions on that? Uh, Michelle, uh, I, I just, I may have mentioned it, but I, could you at least repeat, uh, what did the swimming uh, pool or swimming itself represent to her? I mean, for me, because I am a swimmer, uh, uh -huh. it's very freeing and very meditative. I have my own feeling about just complete relaxation in the swimming. And I don't know what it meant for her, maybe also a sense of community because she doesn't present a swimmer in a lonely way, but she shows them in a community of people, you know, togetherness. So I'm just wondering what the, what swimming and water meant to her. That's, that's, you, you said it really nicely. Uh, one other thing I might add is grew up in Nigeria. Initially, when she was younger, she didn't really have the, you know, ability or facility. It wasn't available to her to be in a swimming pool. But then she uh. went to U.S. to study and she began uh, going to the swimming pool, learn how to swim and she, I think when well, uh, her description is really about once you go into the swimming pool, like you said, Rhoda, being free, but it's also kind of a coming together, uh -huh. uh, a kind of unity, a community feeling. Very interesting. Uh, the the uh, medium for the swimming series, it, it looks very delicate. Is it also, it's not watercolor, is it? So it's, uh, these work are ink. Some acrylic and ink on paper, but there are uh -huh. others also. Um, the one I showed earlier, this particular one is uh, acrylic on canvas. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. That delicacy of the color, so it looks very watercolor, translucent acrylic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna also show another series she did before the swimming pool. It's called a Head and Tail. Um, Basically, she's looking at a currency, coin in particular. So coin, in a way, is kind of universal currencies. And normally, we're most familiar with the image on a coin usually is a male figure of some kind of authoritary position or has some kind of historical importance. So in her series, in this alternative universe, she's using Nigeria young woman, purposely using young woman to be on this coin and she again is using this paper and um, burnt paper very mm -hmm. delicate 
paper. So Beauty. yeah, a lot of things that's in in this also talking about the authority, talking about value system, the worthiness about gender issue, particularly in Nigeria, but also talking about the decline of this currency in Nigeria in relation to this kind of global economic system. I only have few of the images here, but there is a whole series of it. The work, I, I feel very close to her work, partially also because I really like her. We had really good conversations. And currently she is doing a residency in Washington, DC. Um, I'm hoping at some point in the future, we can actually get her um, on our life or even you know, in the future do a physical studio visit to learn more about her recent work. So she's in Washington DC right now in a red, in a red Yes, school. she is finishing up the swimming pool series. I think mm. this will be her last uh, kind of chapter of the swimming pool series. And how big are these um, pieces, the coins? Um, are the they coins like- are uh, small, about 20 by 20, uh, around 20 by 20 kind because uh, she wants to really preserve the originality of the coin, kind of intimate, easy to look at. So, yeah. Um, Wait, is this piece on a cardboard? These are on paper, the burnt paper. But you can see she makes a collage. So it also, there are some uh, cardboards kind of uh, folding onto the paper. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So I think, uh, Maria, I, I feel like this will be a good time to stop and hand it back to you for your next artist. Okay, great. Yeah, if you could change the share setting. Sure. Okay, but like I um like we said earlier, Yasmin is collecting questions for us. So if you have any questions, please chime in through the message box. Next one, before we do anything else, um, I want to burn this um, sage in my second artist's honor, James Luna. He was, uh, he was born 1950 and unfortunately we lost him two years ago, 2018. Oh, well, the candle's not working so well, hold on. My match is not working so well. <laughs> Hold on. Um, and I know this is something um, James would have totally done before his talk or lecture of any kind. So I'm going through the motion of the sage a little bit. Like I said, he passed away two years ago. Um, James Luna was very dear to my heart. Um, so it's it's going to be emotional for me to talk about him today, but I'm gonna do my best to share why. But let's look at this video piece first. And I don't know how loud the audio is going to be, but let's give that a try. The real Indian, take a picture of the real Indian here in the middle of America. When, he, when he's not in his dress, they don't seem to want to take the film. Huh. America likes to name cars and trucks after our tribes. America likes to name film festivals after our sacred dances. Take a picture 
Okay, um, who is James Luna? Let me share that with you. He is Luceno Tribe Indian performance artist. Born 1950, and like I said, he passed away two years ago. He had a heart attack, actually. And there, here he is. He worked on Take a Picture with a Real Indian um, for, I, I believe, three years consecutively, different locations, and you could see um, him standing here in Washington, D.C. Do you see that, Rhoda and Michelle? Yes, of course. Yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, so he's confronting his identity here, how he's being represented as an indigenous person, right? And he apparently did this performance piece until he was agitated, aggravated, or he was tired and he didn't want to do this anymore. So he would stand there for whatever number of hours or minutes and interact with the random strangers who were brave enough to take a photograph with him. So these are different various shots um, that I'm sharing with you. The setting is clearly not outdoor like the DC. It's taking place in a gallery, indoor setting. Um, he is also half Mexican and half Indian. So um, he is honoring both of that mix of those culture, Mexican American culture, right? So he's using half and half to honor that background of his. This is the same image. Now, I'm gonna continue on and carry on and share this particular artist that I didn't really realize until I was looking into James Luna a little bit more. Why? James Earl Frazier, he made this sculptural piece depicting entitled End of the Trail. Do you see that here on the bottom, End of the Trail? Mm -hmm. May 1910. Apparently, James Frazier's father was an engineer for the railroad company during the Westward Expansion Project in America. And when um, James Frazier was young, baby, he came across a meeting different type of indigenous people. And it is there he was able to interact with them in front of the line and he was so inspired, he made a bronze sculpture like this. And what surprised me even more is that this is in the collection at the Met. And you know how much I adore and love the Met just like you, Rhoda. Yes, indeed. <laughs> That's where we met. <laughs> So um, yeah, so keeping this in mind, I had to revisit what happened. You know, why did he title this? What did this artist, James Frazier, title this and the, the trail because of the Trail of Tears. Yeah, trail of Tears, right, right. Well. 1831 to 1877. These um, indigenous people, Native Americans were forced out by the federal government from their land, their home, and they had to go to India and live in a new Indian territory across the Mississippi River. I read somewhere it's like over 120,000 um, Native people had to move, relocate. And as I'm reading about that, I couldn't stop thinking about Syrian refugees today, right? The connection between then with the Native people and now, and how, you know, indigenous people are forgotten almost. So, um, so all of that information was a lot to digest. And here's James Luna using that image for his background in this color Xerox copy. And then he put himself in center. 
And what stood out to me was that half filled liquor bottle. Right. Wow. And mm. then he's sitting on a salt bench. But that expression, you know, he's almost passed out. And then that title, End of the Frail. Not end of the trail, but end of the frail. So if you think about frail, you know, weak, powerless, helpless, lost. So what is he talking about? What is he tapping into? He's thinking about alcoholism, right? He's talking about poor conditions in these Indian reservations, poor health. So he's thinking about a lot of issue that he probably had faced living in Indian Reservation, where La Jolla Reservation in San Diego. And I was one of those lucky people, friends, to have visited with him. That's why he is still so dear to my heart. And to know that he passed away two years ago is still like hard to uh, accept. So um, this is my favorite piece coming up next one. He titled yeah. it Artifact Peace, 1987. He included his own body as his artwork. What do you think about this piece? <laughs> He's a performance artist. He included himself to be part of it. Can, can you imagine laying in a case like that or <laughs> on a platform like this? How did he go to a bathroom? He must have been able to meditate. <laughs> I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about. How did he go to the bathroom? So, um, and just like Kara Walker's sugar-coated Sphinx, that giant monumental public art piece, I'm sure people have came and touched him too. <laughs> 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 and shocked people along the way, I could only imagine, right? So um, he's laying there presenting himself as the actual artifact because he didn't like the way these indigenous people were honored in a largely art, white art dominated world. So, um, and apparently there were labels that also accompanied, um, which talked about where his scars were located so um, yeah, I mean, this is very, very moving piece for me. And I wanna read this um, statement with you. He was interviewed by the Smithsonian and um, let me move this so I could see. He said, Luna explained one driving force behind his work. I had long looked at representation of our peoples in museums and they did all dwelled in the past. They were one-sided. We were simply objects among bones, bones among objects, and then signed and sealed with a date. In that framework, you really couldn't talk about joy, intelligence, humor, or anything that I know make up our people. What do you think about that statement? Well, uh, he's commenting on uh, on the stereotypes that we have uh, attributed to uh, Native Americans, and uh, we fail to look at the deeper side of the person. I think he makes that clear. Yeah, and but he did have a great sense of humor. He titled this, We Become Them, yeah. using these tribal masks that you see here often at majority of the museums. Um, now, I wanted to end him and honor him with this piece. He wanted to be a rock and roll star. Wow. Do we recognize him, who he's trying to be on the right with the American flag? We all know who this is, don't we? Unless you're like really young. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. And then on the left with the fire do you recognize who that could have been? Elvis, maybe? You're thinking Elvis. I oh. thought I had a picture here, but um, I guess it's not here in this one. Jimi Hendrix. Oh, Jimi Hendrix, okay. 
Um, the burning fire is the big gigantic clue there, but he collaged his face onto it. And um, apparently Jimi Hendrix personal, his great grandmother's background was Afro Cherokee tribe. So that kind of history links itself, doesn't it? I don't even know if James knew at the time when he was trying to be that popular rock and roll star, you know? Um, but I wanted to um, end with him actually singing and pretending to be that rock and roll star on stage because that's what he enjoyed the most. And I remember getting a call from him saying, hey, I finally get to be a rock and roll star <laughs> through my live performance on stage. So um, yeah, let's me not too overly critical <laughs> when you hear him sing. <laughs> and he often talks about his reservation, his home life, his best friends like Willie Nelson, Johnny Pine, and these are the people that I was lucky enough to have met them before he died. They all died. Um, so here he is singing away. Oh, not that one. Wait, no, this one. Yep. Okay. Ready? Everyone ready? This audio may be too loud. I'm not so sure. Let's see. <laughs> to stop here because of our time. I don't know what everyone's schedule is like. So I would like to end on that note as far as James Luna goes. So everyone, thank you. Now back to Michelle. Thank you, uh, Maria. I'm, I'm very touched by two artists that you presented. Uh, my next artist, Lisa Curran Davis, is I think her approach is a bit different from these two artists and even different from uh, Madhu Peola, which is more direct uh, kind of uh, confrontation and representational work. Lisa Curran Davis work uh, is very complex, I would say. So let me just start by sharing my screen. Can you guys see it? So I'm just going to quote something I asked her and she did an interview. She said that I feel that I've been always implicated whenever people around me understood African-American culture to be. I wasn't trying to make a statement about being black, of all about race relations. It was more a personal search to figure out what the importance of race was and what constitute notions of race for me. So Lisa Curran Davis, I consider her background, she was born in Baltimore into an African-American family and grew up in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. So she was able to, as her uh, you know, 
coming of age explores different culture and experience different culture. Then she came to New York and she studied at the Pratt and Hunter College. So her work is looking at tendency of our human being want to be categorized and want to be limited, but looking at how complex that is and what is the open-endness of this conversation. Over the years, she also developed these uh, quite striking techniques that maneuver her abstract painting looks like map-like image. It's actually a fictionary map. So actually, I think it's better for me to share this video and where she's talking about her work and her technique so we get a better sense of um, what her work's like. And this is a video made while she was in a residence in Siena, Italy. One of the things I've noticed in Siena, which I'm really interested in now, I'm not sure it's coming to the work yet, but in a town like Siena, the things that made people feel secure were walls, you know, walls and boundaries and lookouts and higher vantage points. And so I'm really interested in bringing that notion in of how a walled structure provides a kind of security. I don't want them to be literal maps at all. I certainly want them to suggest maps as um, being somewhere, being located. I want that to be the starting point in the work, but I also want that to disappear and shift uh, according to one's subjectivity in the work and also the formal play I do with spatial relationships. I have lots of things I use, the grid, measured lines, colors that we dismiss as mapped colors, and then I have the other side, which is the fictional side, the psychological side, the organic, certain toxic colors, things that feel untrustworthy. I just use these languages and go back and forth. So there's a complex mix of neither holding ground, um, both of them coexisting and almost shifting constantly between each other. So I feel, you know, I could have said it better than what she does in her video, but I also, I wanted to really show some of the installation photos. Can you guys see me? Yes. Okay. And that she has been doing, you know, her work has been widely collected at major institutions like the MoMA, the Getty, also very well received in, in for private clients. I brought her to Miami Basel, got enormous response. Since the pandemic, um, so, so normally she works in uh, Brooklyn and she has her studio also in Brooklyn. But since the pandemic, she moved to upstate New York and has been working out of her studio in Hudson, New York. And I've asked her, um, how does this experience, the pandemic experience and the reason Black Lives Matter experience impact her? Does that change her view about her a statement of making art and what is, what is the implication? And she basically said that that whole experience actually made her work to be even more complicated. Uh, in terms of her making, if you look at the image or composition, it's much more complex. And she think it's the work is much more forceful because there is the energy of anger just coming out. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see what's, what's the finished version of her new work. I also want to point out that not only is she a really well-respected artist, she is a 
very, very passionate art educators. She's been teaching in the MFA program at Yale for many years, now at Hunter, has many students that really shares uh, affinity towards her. So Maria, I know our session is about an hour long. Yep. And I think it's about time. For q and yeah. So let's stop the um, sharing and I could um, go back to and um, see Yasmin if you're with us and you could hear us. Um, yep, I can hear you just fine. Okay, so please join us for, um, you know, for the conclusion. Um, well, it's more of a comment than it is a question, but it was something that maybe you guys could expand on. Um, it was one made by Kim Garcia. And sh her comment was, Carol Walker's sugar art reminds me of the romanticist's fascination with the transients and decay of full ruins. It becomes a powerful statement about monuments. And maybe expanding on the role of monuments or the connection or kind of parallel between the romantic movement and a lot of Carol Walker's own art. Wow, that was deep, Kim. Wow, <laughs> wow I love it. Anything else? Um, it was again, it was just a comment. We love it. We want to keep these um, virtual, you know, talks going. So please subscribe. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you, Michelle, Rhoda, Yasmin.